Daniel Peacock was born on the 2nd of October 1958 in the borough of Hammersmith, London. His father was Trevor Peacock, the actor and composer. He attended Ashmole School in Southgate. Inspired by his father, Daniel would try to succeed in the acting industry. He would go on to Barnet College and then he attended the Central School of Speech and Drama. But all humans want to feel safe, they want to feel loved and they want to feel heard. In 1978, he worked as a blue coat for Pontins in Selsey, West Sussex. Daniel would also start making his first television appearances. Quite a few, yeah. Um, that was actually, I think it was, I think I was, but I know I was, I was 20 because we were in Brighton on my 20th birthday, I seem to remember. Um, it was actually my first professional job. I, I, no, no, I tell you a lie, it was my second job. In 1979, he would appear in the film version of Porridge alongside Ronnie Barker. Yeah, Porridge, um, with Ronnie Barker. That was great, he was a great guy. Thank the rights. Yeah, yeah. Just like me. If we had been caught, we'd have been Jack the Lab, wouldn't we? But we was. We was collared, and that's that. So don't bleat. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. I ain't bleating. Good. In 1982, Daniel would join the cast of the comic strip, and he would go on to make nine appearances. You see, the comic strip was always very important to me because that sort of, I was very young, and that sort of not you know, helped me sort of move, move into certain areas. I'd done two, the first two episodes um, of the comic strip. I was going, we were going up weeks later for the third episode, and Dawn French said, "Do you want to come and lift with me?" I went, "Yeah, great." And uh, she said, yeah, come round to my flat. So I'm, I'm in the morning, we'll drive up. So I went, okay, great. So I went around. And I'd gotten very well with Dawn prior to that. So, it was, you know, you know she, she's always been, you know, very down to earth and really great person. I couldn't believe that you could get in a car with four of your best mates, drive down to Devon, knowing you're going to spend, you know, the next month making great films and having a good laugh. I say, you four look as though you're having a pretty exciting time of it. I think I'll come cycling with you for a bit. No, thanks. We don't talk to other children. Now, look here. I own this village, so you better be nice to me. Look, just clear off or we'll call the police. I, I, I didn't mean to be rude. It's all because I'm an only child and I'm stinking rich and I've never had any friends. You all look so decent. Please, can I come with you? No, we don't want you. Do we, Anne? Well, I suppose he could stay with us for a short time, couldn't he? What do you say, Dick? Well... If he promises to be good, then I suppose it wouldn't hurt. All right, then. But you must do exactly as we tell you. Oh, I promise. I'll do anything just to be friends with you. Well, I say, look, it's Toby Thurlow. Toby. Toby! What on earth are you doing here? Waiting for eternity. Who are you? You must be drugged. She doesn't know who we are. Relax, everybody. Be like sand. This is the manager. He's a my best friend. Nice to meet you, Mr. Pastadas. <laughs> You'll be in my hotel at four o'clock, you bastard in Glazy. I was also a big, a big fan of the young ones, especially Rick Mail. That was like the first televised implication that things were comedically changing on television. It was Rick Mail. I said, we need five cups, Mike. My, my sense of humour, I've always, did I say, enjoyed my sense of humour. I enjoy laughing with people. I enjoy making people laugh. I enjoy people making me laugh. From the early to mid-80s, Daniel would appear in numerous films, television programs, and TV adverts. When you do that, it calls on something in human nature, something that 
makes his hatred for you decrease and his respect increase. I think Christ grasped that, and I have seen it work. Good morning. Get off the pavement, you bloody coon. Yeah. Get off. Careful. <laughs> Alan! Alan! What's he doing? Nothing. Come out where I can see you. It should be good tonight, though, eh? Plenty of birds, plenty of booze. <laughs> <laughs> Chips or jacket spuds? Will it be salad or frozen peas? Will it be mushrooms? Fried onion rings? You'll have to wait and see. Bird's Eye introduced Steakhouse Grills. Pure ground beef that you cook like a steak and serve like a steak. What will you give your old man with his Steakhouse Grill? Hope it's chips, it's chips. We hope it's chips, it's chips. Bird's Eye Steakhouse Grills. Leather look shelving 229 and Marley super soft flooring from 775. They're doing ring fluorescent light fittings 599 and 50% off polycell double glazing. In 1985, he would appear in a classic episode of Only Fools and Horses, playing Mental Mickey. Come on, Rodney, give us some symbol. symbols! Symbols? <laughs> because it was Ray Butt, um, who was... He didn't actually direct that episode, I don't think, but he was in charge, if you will. And he called me in to the BBC offices, so I went in and... Uh, sat me down, had a cup of, cup of tea, and he just said, look, just look at the script. So I always remember this, and I wish I'd kept that version of the script. It's, and I, I hope this doesn't sound too smart, I don't mean it to. But it said, Mental Mickey, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, should be played by someone like Daniel, should be played by someone like Daniel Peacock. And I remember saying that, and John Sullivan had written that, and I remember thinking, ah, okay. They start, so he came straight back in with a smile, Ray Buck did, and he said, uh, well, Dan, you want to do it? I said, of course I do. And that was... That was it, and it was, I was in and out. One, two, three. Atta! 
told you once, Rodney. I'm not going to tell you again, son. I do the one, two, three, four. Right. Right. One, two, three, four. I remember being in uh, like this little, it wasn't even a trailer, it was like a little caravan thing for like six hours in the white suit and not having very much to do. And David Jason came in and he said, you're all right. And, you know, I said, yeah. Because he, he knew that I had, I had a long wait ahead of me. Uh, so he wanted to make sure that, you know, even though I was just there for a few days, and, uh, that, you know, he was, he was looking after the guys that just turned up for a couple of days. So once again, he was a top man and is a top man. I don't believe it. Don't believe it. It's a bunch of Wallis. What do they think they're doing? They're on top of the pops. <laughs> uh, so to suddenly be on top of the pops, even though we weren't a real band, they thought people thought we were a real band. It was Spando Bally, I think it was, walked up the stairs and started to talk to us about where we were in the charts. Because it was even then such an iconic show, and I was so pleased to be in it, you do sort of think, oh, this is actually, I'm actually in the Fourth Norses. Okay, I better remember my lines. What am I supposed to say? You know, you, you, there's actors uh, that you that you always you kind of like, okay, yeah, I really like that guy. Uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to be working with him. And uh, so, and again, yeah, all, all those Fourth Norses guys were like that to me, you know, because I was aware of them and I liked the show, I loved the show. and so when you're in that situation, you meet these people, you are aware of, in a way, you know, what they've meant to you regarding their characters in a particular programme. Wait, Grandad, do you want a jemmy? <laughs> no, I had one before we left. <laughs> so it probably is sort of pound for pound the, the best, you know, even though you've got your 40 towels and porridge and things like that, it's probably the best uh, sitcom this country's ever produced. In 1987, Daniel would appear in the sitcom Valentine's Park and from the mid to late 1980s, he would make many more TV appearances. I couldn't handle that, though, I'd probably faint. No, 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 you won't faint, you won't faint. It's very simple. Like I say, I'm an absolute master with the birds. All you've got to do is give them the eye. Give them the eye? The eye, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> giving him the eye. Not that sort of eye, stupid. Oi! <laughs> See, they're looking. Come on, China. Sinbad, my man. How's tricks? Making a bob off three. Yourself, Mr. Roach? Yeah, doing fine. Our trials are starting. <laughs> That's my dad's dog, that one. Dark one. Go on, son, run! <laughs> you had half a wally sometimes. Scanners getting on. He must have been somewhere else. Hey, punk! Easy on the laundry. Your brother's big in movies. Try down by the Audi, you know. <laughs> My name's Jim. Jim? No, oh, yeah, Jim Genie. I've got a brother called Jeremy Genie, a sister called Geraldine Genie. But how did you become a genie in the first place? Well, how should I know? Is there any particular outfit you want me to wear? Oh, true. Mm. To attract the right sort of clientele, may I recommend my dumb waiter's outfit? <laughs> That'll do nicely, eh? Oh, thanks very much, Squire. It's 1966. Geoffrey Stephen Foster was born at the Stoke Newington General Hospital at ten minutes past four. Oh, hello. <laughs> 
In 1991, Daniel would appear in the action-adventure film Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And I say we can win. They got armor! Yeah. What I loved about Prince of Thieves that, that you never see on the screen, obviously, is that all the guys that were the merry men, we spent 13 weeks together basically playing cards and, you know, because we were never wanted. And so playing cards and we really developed and going away to lovely places all over the, all over the country to, you know, to, cause they wanted to pick all the best bits of England to make out. It was, you know, it was just one sh big Sherwood forest, waterfalls and certain parts of woods and things like that. So we were always sort of on the road traveling about. I really loved all the guys we, you know, that, that went up to make the Merry, the, the Merry Men. We had such a great time together. Uh, and as, as I said earlier, it's to do with that camaraderie uh, of actors. I, um, when I'm not acting, I do miss that a great deal. Look, take the one on the left. Which one's left? Which one are you taking? Do you mean which one am I taking? If you're taking the one on the left, I'm taking the one on the right. Which one's the one on the right? The one next to the one on the... Donation, if you please. Donation? For what? It was Jack Wild, right, and who I got on so well with. Not just because he was Jack Wild, but we, we were quite similar on many, many ways. He's thinking, why are we all getting on so well? We are all... We get, I suddenly realised that what they've done is they cast a group of people who are very different, obviously, in shape and size and, and, and age, but yet somehow would look like they would gel if you will, and that's what we actually did as, as, as people. Throughout the early 1990s, Daniel would appear in numerous popular sitcoms of the time, and in 1993, he would make a remarkable appearance in the comedy One Foot in the Grave. Like my women, golden, hot and covered in marmalade. <laughs> Career, basically, I play two sorts of parts. One is the hard man, and the other one is idiot. And I've never really been a hard man. I've always been a bit of an idiot. If we find any, and I think we will, you may be arrested as an accessory after the fact to murder. You're bluffing. I'm building a case against me. What are you desperate or what? Also, from the 1990s, Daniel would start writing and creating popular kids' TV programmes for children's television. Pace in space! I really rather like Sam. I've really made my living as a writer, and people will never know this, but that's, you know, I've written quite a lot of shows. I wrote a show called... Uh, uh, teenage health freak. His writing's always been my thing, and that's always been my passion. Yes. Not in the house, Peter. Who's this supposed to be? Gus Aldrin. Absolute idiot. <laughs> In 2002, Daniel would receive a Children's BAFTA Best Writer nomination for his TV programme, Harry and Kosh. He answered, kiss me again. What are you doing it? Your mum told me I'd find you here. I wrote a show called Cave Girl for BBC, uh, for BBC rather. And um, that, was, that proved to be I uh, went down very, very well indeed. I was just so happy. I just couldn't believe it that I'd got, you know, um, the main part in a new children's television series at the BBC. It was, you know, insane. It was like the best, best day of my life. I was approached to write the film version, which I've now written, and uh, we're meeting the American director on, I think it's, Wednesday uh, next week, but that's taken me about a year to write. So I've been locked away doing that, and I'm I'm, I'm actually genuinely very excited about it. 
Daniel's private life has always been guarded, and by the mid-1990s, he moved from his Shepherd's Bush home to Weybridge. It was here he became a director of Two Hats Production Company until 2004. He also went on to have a few children, and by 2007 he was living in Ripley, Surrey. In 2007, Daniel would voice a dinosaur in the popular children's TV show, The Beeps. Hello there, Teeny Beep. My, have you been running? Yes! I came here as quick as I could! <sighs> You've got to join us for breakfast! Breakfast? Why is that? We're having moon fruit marmalade! Moon fruit marmalade? No, 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 Teeny, no, sorry, no! I can't, no, no, not moon, no, not moon fruit, no! No, 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 I can't have moon fruit! No, never, never, ever! You'll have to keep it away from me! He would also appear in the comic strips 5, Go to Rehab. Tobini Thurlow! So you're the one that's behind this dodgy rehab clinic? Yes. I couldn't resist being part of your touching reunion. And now you can be part of my game. Five get locked up forever. I still act. Uh, I was on a um, show called Starlings on, um, on I think, Sky One, uh, which was rather good. Uh, I loved doing that, actually. Keep your feet warm in the winter. Lovely. Now, listen, listen. When was the last time you were drowned in a bottle of scotch? Because I can fix it for you. Where does he get these? I don't ask where you get your money, you don't ask where I get my socks. In 2015, Daniel would write and produce Marley's Ghosts. I had a show, uh, Marley's Ghosts, on UK TV, which went rather well. We did two series of that. You need to leave, now. That's exactly what the taxi driver said. Fundamentally, Marley's Ghosts, it's all about the relationship between Marley and her husband, Adam, and Marley's lover, Michael, both of whom die very quickly into episode one. It was the second series to get some sort of little solitary place. So I bought a, a caravan. So, I'm, uh, so I had my place in Cobham, but I, I, I put a caravan in uh, Romney uh, to write the second series. But I was enjoying you know, being right on the beach, basically. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. By 2018, Daniel's father, Trevor, was in the advanced stages of dementia and he had moved from his home, Paviot's Mill, in Somerset, to a nursing home in Yeovil. He died in 2021, and this inspired Daniel to start working in a care home himself. Knowing you... Uh-huh. One of the reasons for me being actually genuinely enthusiastic about changing career streams, if you will, was my father, Trevor. I never was close to him in the last few years. Obviously he had the disease, this terrible, terrible disease, but I wanted to be closer to him and I regret not being as close as I, I should have been. He's just being diagnosed with third dementia. It had obviously really accelerated. Um, he did recognise me, but that was about it, I think. This is dementia, is it? This is what it's like. Uh, which was absolutely shocking. The time just after that, maybe six months later, I went up, and uh, now Dad was, he, he looked physically different uh, and, and had got decidedly worse, really. And at that time, I, I, it really hit me bad, and I cried and cried and cried, you know, like we all do from time to time. Of course, there, there were challenges, but I interpret that as opportunities. I never see things as challenges, I see them as opportunities. I did do a BBC show recently called Strike. I did an episode of that. 
So, which I kind of need to do every now and then to to um, keep me funded, if you will. You're cheeky, aren't you? Come on, give me a kiss. Yeah, all right, mate. Enjoy your visit. I'm glad you're old man's all right. Not saying bye-bye to Sadie. She'll be asleep now. From 2019 to the present, Daniel would become the Lifestyles Coordinator at Hastings Court Care Home in East Sussex. I used to earn quite a lot of money for doing not very much. And now I earn not very much for doing lots and lots and lots. In 2022, Daniel was nominated for a National Care Award at the Park Plaza in Westminster, London. Coming to work in the morning, I don't call it coming to work in the morning, I call it coming in to have a rather wonderful time. I am a much better person for having worked here just over three years, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, dare I say. When I was a younger man, I used to make quite a lot of money. I used to have quite a lovely lifestyle. Being here with next to nothing now, in my, in my twilight years, do I say, I've kind of lost everything, and yet, here I am, uh, the happiest, the most fulfilled, the most rewarded I've ever been in my life.